Although Daenerys Targaryen only has five chapters in A Clash of Kings, they are filled with so much magic, wonder and terror that they've been a subject of a lot of speculations, particularly the visions she receives in the House of the Undying. While some of them are straightforward, others are strange or even incoherent, and it's difficult to point out what they meant. Here are my interpretations. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. If you have your own theories regarding the meaning of these visions, feel free to share them in the comments. Also remember to click the notification button so that you never miss any video. Daenerys arrives in Carth after she and her Kalasar go through an arduous march to the Red Waste, following the comment that first appeared before Drogo's funeral pyre. If they took another route, they would risk being enslaved by another Kalasar and the dragons cannot protect them since they are too small. When they settle for a while in an abandoned city, Valles Toloro, Dany sends her blood riders to scout the area and find the nearest settlements. Rakara returns after reaching the seashore. Ago finds two more cities similar to Valles Toloro. But Drago returns with three messengers from the splendid city of Carf: Piat Pri, a warlock, Xaroxo and Daxos, a trader, and Quaif, a shadowbinder from Ashai. While Quaif gives Danny ominous prophecies about the future and Xaro helps her negotiate with the traders of Carf, Piat Pri wants Danny to go to the House of the Undying, a house where mysterious warlocks reside. Before Dani enters the place, Piat Pri informs her how to navigate the place and what she might expect. By no means, Piat Pri said. Living and coming, it is the same. Always up. Always the door to your right. Other doors might open to you. Within you will see many things that disturb you. Visions of loveliness and visions of horror. Wonders and terrors. Sights and sights of days gone by and days to come and days that never were. Dwellers and servitors might speak to you as you go. Answer or ignore them as you choose, but enter no room until you reach the audience chamber. Danny drinks Shade of the Evening, which opens her senses to the magic, and these are the things she encounters while she travels the place. In one room, a beautiful woman sprawled naked on the floor while four little men crawled over her. They had rattish pointed faces and tiny pink hands, like the servitor who had brought her the glass of shade. One was pumping between her thighs, another savaged her breast, worrying at the nipples with his wet red mouth, tearing and chewing. This is a straightforward imaginary. The beautiful woman is a symbolic depiction of Westeros, and the four dwarves who ravage her are the currently living four kings of the War of the Five Kings, Joffrey, Rob, Stannis and Balon. There's only four because at that point, Renly is already dead. Farther on, she came upon a feast of corpses. Savagely slaughtered, the feasters lay strewn across overturned chairs and hacked trestle tables, as prowling pools of congealing blood. Some had lost limbs, even heads. Severed hands clutched bloody cups, wooden spoons, roast full, heels of bread. In a throne above them sat a dead man with the head of a wolf. He wore an iron crown and held a leg of lamp in one hand, as a him might hold a scepter, and his eyes followed Danny with mute appeal. This is the vision of the future. That is his division of the Red Wedding. A man with a wolf's head and an iron crown points to Rob Stark. After Rob's death, his dire wolf is also killed and his head is sewn to Rob's body. Rob looks at Danny, pleading for help. She fled from him, but only as far as the next open door. I know this room, she thought. She remembered those great wooden beams and the carved animal faces that adorned them. And there outside the window, a lemon tree. The sight of it made her heart ache with longing. It is the house with the red door, the house in Bravos. No sooner had she felt it than old Sir William came into the room, leaning heavily on his stick. Little princess, there you are, he said in his gruff kind voice. Come, he said, come to me, my lady. You're home now, you're safe now. His big wrinkled hand reached for her, soft as old leather, and Danny wanted to take it and hold it and kiss it, 
She wanted that as much as she had ever wanted anything. Her foot edged forward. And then she thought, he's dead, he's dead. This sweet old bear, he died a long time ago. She backed away and ran. This is a vision of the past, of the days of Danny's childhood, in the house with the red door. It's there to tempt Danny and test her character. Finally, a great pair of bronze doors appeared to her left, grander than the rest. They swung open as she neared, and she had to stop and look. Beyond loomed a cavernous stone hole, the largest she had ever seen. The skulls of dead dragons looked down from its walls. Upon a towering barbed throne sat an old man in rich robes, an old man with dark eyes and long silver grey hair. Let him be the king of the charred bones and cooked meat, he said to a man below him. Let him be the king of ashes. Dragon shrieked, his clothes digging through silk and skin, but the king on his throne never heard, and Danny moved on. This is clearly Ares, a vision of the past, him speaking to Rosart and his other pyromancers about his plan to burn King's Landing. The wording matches Jamie's description of the situation. Interestingly, Drogon reacts negatively to him and Danny herself quickly leaves. The appearance of this vision is often used to argue that Danny will become like Ares or burn King's Landing in his place, but Drogon's anger at the vision points in a completely opposite direction. Viserys was her first thought the next time she paused, but a second glance told her otherwise. The man had her brother's hair, but he was taller, and his eyes were dick indigo rather than lilac. Egon, he said to a woman nursing a newborn babe in a great wooden bed. What better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. He went to the window seat, picked up a harp, and ran his fingers lightly over its silvery strings. Sweet sadness filled the room as man and wife and babe faded like the morning mist, only the music lingering behind to speed her on her way. This is Regar, Elia and little Egon. Regar tells Elia about the prophecy about the prince that was promised. One of the things in House of the Dragon that came directly from George R. R. Martin is the fact that the Targaryens knew about the Long Night and have been passing the prophecy about it from king to heir, just like Viserys passes the prophecy to Rhaenyra in episode 1. When Viserys and Rhaenyra discuss the prophecy in episode 4, the wording is very similar. From my blood come the prince that was promised. And his will be the song of ice and fire. And Regar says, he has a song. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. According to Aemon, Regar at first thought that he was the prince, but then changed his mind and believed that his son Aegon would be the prince that was promised, because there was a red comet in the sky when Aegon was conceived. How the hell did Rhaegar know when Aegon was conceived? I have no idea. But what's most interesting is that Rhaegar seems to see Dany and says that there must be a third head of the dragon, as if guiding her towards that destiny. Not only does Dany hear the ancestral prophecy as if she was Rhaegar's heir, she also learns that she needs two more people in the equation, three heads of the dragon. So there has to be the prince and his two companions, with Dany being the center of the three heads. Later Dany is tested again by a false vision of Piat Pri. When she stopped, she found herself in yet another dark stone chamber. But this time the door opposite was round, shaped like an open mouth, and Piat Pri stood outside in the grass beneath the trees. Can it be that the undying are done with you so soon? He asked in disbelief when he saw her. So soon? She said, confused. I've walked for hours, and still not found them. You have taken a wrong turning. Come, I will lead you. Piat Pri held out his hand. Nani hesitated. There was a door to her right, still closed. That's not the way, Piat Pri said firmly, his blue lips prim with disapproval. The undying ones will not wait forever. Our little lives are no more than a flicker of a moth's wing to them, Danny said, remembering. Stubborn child, you will be lost and never found. She walked away from him, to the door on the right. No, Piat screeched. No, to me, come to me, to me. His face crumbled inward, changing to something pale and warm-like. The next door she goes through is made out of weirwood. It's worth noting that there is a similar one in the wall. Then Dany sees wizards and kings. Beyond the doors was a great hall and a splendor of wizards. Some wore sumptuous robes of ermine, rawy velvet, and cloth of gold, 
Others fancied elaborate armor studded with gemstones or tall pointed hats speckled with stars. There were women among them, dressed in gowns of surprising loveliness. Shafts of sunlight slanted through windows of stained glass and the air was alive with the most beautiful music she had ever heard. A kingly man in rich robes rose when he saw her and smiled. The nurse of House Targaryen, be welcome. Come and share the food of forever. We are the undying of Carf. Long have we awaited you, said the woman beside him, clad in rose and silver. The breast she had left bare in the cartoon fashion was as perfect as a breast could be. We knew you were to come to us, the wizard king said. A thousand years ago we knew, and have been waiting all this time. We sent the comet to show you the way. We have knowledge to share with you, said the warrior in shining emerald armor, and magic weapons to arm you. You have passed every trial. Now come and sit with us, and all your questions shall be answered. She took a step forward. But then Dragon leaped from her shoulder. He flew to the top of the ebony and weirwood door, perched there, and began to bite at the carved wood. A willful beast, laughed a handsome young man. Shall we teach you the secret speech of Dragonkind? Come, come. Then finally, she sees the true undying. A long stone table filled this room. Above it floated a human heart, swollen and blue with corruption, yet still alive. It bet, a deep ponderous drop of sound, and each pulse sent out a wash of indigo light. The figures around the table were no more than blue shadows. As Danny walked to the empty chair at the foot of the table, they did not stir, nor speak, nor turn to face her. There was no sound but the slow, deep beat of the rotting heart. Mother of dragons, came a voice, part whisper and part moan. Dragons, dragons, dragons. Other voices echoed in the gloom. Some were male and some female. One spoke with the timbre of a child. The floating heart pulsed from dimness to darkness. It was hard to summon the will to speak, to recall the words she had practiced so assiduously. I am the nearest Storborn of House Targaryen, Queen of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Do they hear me? Why don't they move? She sat folding her hands in her lap. Grant me your counsel, and speak to me with the wisdom of those who have conquered death. Through the indigo murk, she could make out the wizened features of the undying one to her right, an old old man, wrinkled and hairless. His flesh was ripped, violet blue. His lips and nails bluer still, so dark they were almost black. Even the whites of his eyes were blue. They stared and seeing at the ancient woman on the opposite of the table, whose gown of pale silk had rotted on her body. One withered breast was left bare in the carving manner, to show a pointed blue nipple hard as leather. She is not breathing. Danny listened to the silence. None of them are breathing, and they do not move, and those eyes see nothing. Could it be that the undying ones were dead? Her answer was a whisper as thin as a mouse whisker. We live, 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 it sounded. Myriad other voices whispered echoes. And no, 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 no. Both the false vision of the undying and the true one has a woman in a carving gown, so it's possible that the first vision is how the undying looked like before they became the undying. <laughs> I have come for the gift of truth, Danny said. In the long haul, the things I saw, were there true visions or lies? Past things or things to come? What did they mean? The shape of shadows, morrows not yet made. Drink from the cup of ice, drink from the cup of fire. Mother of dragons, child of three. Three? She did not understand. Three heads has the dragon, the ghost chorus yammered inside her skull, with never a lip moving. Never a breath stirring the still blue air. Mother of dragons, child of storm. The whisper became a swirling song. Three fires must you light, one for life and one for death and one to love. Her own heart was beating in unison to the one that floated before her, blue and corrupt. Three mounts must you ride, one to bet and one to dread and one to love. The voices were growing louder, she realized, and it seemed her heart was flowing, and even her breath. Three treasons will you know. Once for blood, and once for gold, and once for love. Child of Three is a reference to the various trees that repeat in Danny's arc. She received three dragon eggs and hatched three dragons. She received three handmaids as a wedding gift. She is visited by three residents of Carf in Vaes Toloro. She has three blood riders. She is a third living child of Freyla and Aerys. 
She is a third Daenerys in the Targaryen dynasty, after Daenerys, daughter of Jay Harris and Ali Zane, and Daenerys of Dorne, with fire and blood even retconning the family tree, so that she is indeed the third one. She receives three ships that she renames Balerion, Meraxis, and Vagar. She conquers three slave cities, and finally, her house's heraldry is a dragon with three heads. Three heads has the dragon is the same thing Rhaegar said. Dana needs to find two more people for the dragon to have three heads, with herself taking center stage. There are various speculations on who this might be. It's pretty much a given that one of them will be Jon Snow and some of the visions that she sees later also point in that direction, but who will be the third? Some people point to Aegon, the Blackfire kid who claims to be Rhaegar's son. Another popular choice is Tyrion, though he does not have the blood of the dragon to claim a dragon. We have to wait and see. Mother of Dragons, Child of Storm, is of course a reference to Dany's dragons and the fact that she was born during the storm. And there is Stormborn. The themes of trees repeat often in these visions. Three fires must you light, one for life and one for death and one to love. It's hard to say whether they say that Dany must do this in the future or if the past events might count as well. If we assume the latter, the fire for life is probably the funeral pyre that gave life to the dragons. Then there's fire for death. This can mean several things. Many insist that fire for death must be done in Burning King's Landing, but given that all the foreshadowing and setup points towards John Con or Cersei, I don't believe it. Fire for death to me refers to the fire she lights during her anti-slavery campaign. That is, the fire she kills Krasnus with, and the fire that will burn all over Essos as she continues her campaign. The phrasing of the third fire is strange. Not for love, but to love. To me, the love in question is the love for humanity, and her decision to fight against the others, lighting the fire to repel them. It can also be interpreted as Dany possibly burning the Iron Throne. Three mounts must be right. One to bed, and one to dread, and one to love. This one is pretty straightforward. Mount to bed is her silver that she wrote before her wedding night with Drago. Mount to dread is likely Dragon, who is considered Balerion the Black Dread Reborn. What will be the mount to love? This is the second time love is repeated. Again, the mount may be her mounting dragon to fight the others out of love for humanity and a wish for its survival, or perhaps a reveal about her future love interest. Three treasons will you know, once for blood, and once for gold, and once for love. This prophecy is phrased differently. While before it was must, here it's will, assuming that these are the things that have not yet happened, in contrast to the previous ones. Dani believes that the first prophecy already happened, that Miri was a betrayal for Blood. But Dani faces far more than just three betrayals that could fit this bit. For example, she is betrayed by Jorah in what could be the betrayal for gold, and by Brown Ben Plum, also for gold. She is betrayed by Xaro when he declares war on her, with the reasoning also being gold. The prophecy slavers lose because of her campaign. Galaza Galare might count as betrayal for Blood, since Dani spilled the blood of her family when she took Mirin. Given that Dani is betrayed more than once, could it be that it's not the betrayals Dani will experience at the hands of others, but the betrayals she will commit or other people will commit for her? It does not say you will be betrayed three times, it's you will know them. In that case, my personal interpretation is that three betrayals are about her conquest of the slave cities and they align with her conquest of Slaver's Bay. In Astapor, she betrays Krasnus Monaclos for the blood of the slaves. Astapor is heavily associated with blood. Bricks and blood build Astapor. White Bird murmured at her side. And Bricks and blood her people. What is that? Nanny asked him, curious. An old rhyme a magister taught me, when I was a boy. I never knew how true it was. The bricks of Astapor are red with the blood of the slaves who make them. In Yonkai, Dani offers the storm crows to turn cloaks for her and keep any plunder they may gather during the sack while pointing out that the wages they may receive from Yonkai are meager. This causes Daria to kill the other captains and join Dani's side. He betrayed them and Yunkai for gold. The betrayal for love has not yet happened, but will. And in my opinion, this will be the betrayal of the false peace in Mirin, done for love to the freedmen. It's of course only one possible interpretation. Let me know what you think in the comments. Then the visions change slowly to the images, followed by various monikers. Viserys screamed as the molten gold ran down his cheeks and filled his mouth. A tall lord with copper skin and silver gold hair stood beneath the banner of a fiery stallion, a burning city behind him. Robis flew like drops of blood from the chest of a dying prince, and he sank to his knees in the water, and with his last breath murmured a woman's name. 
Two of these are visions of the past, and one a vision of something that never happened. First is the death of Viserys in Vaes the Track. A tall lord with copper skin and silver gold hair is how Rhaegar would have looked like if he lived, as a stallion who mounts the world. We can see that he would have a personal heraldry, a fiery stallion, a combination of his heritage, a Dothraki and a Targaryen. He fits the description of Rhaegar Dany has in her third dragon dream in A Game of Thrones. He has Dany's hair, the dragon's skin. Third vision is Rhaegar dying on the trident. According to George R. R. Martin, the name he murmured was Lyanna. These three visions are followed by Mother of Dragons, Daughter of Death. All three men in the vision died so that Dany could become what she is now. To be reborn as a Mother of Dragons, she must be a Daughter of Death. According to my theory, this vision also shows the lives that went into dragon eggs to make them alive. Glowing like sunset, a red sword was raised in the hand of a blue-eyed king who cast no shadow. A clothed dragon swayed on poles amid the cheering crowd. From a smoking tower, a great stone beast took wing, breathing shadow fire. Mother of Dragons, Slayer of Lies. These are all the lies that Dany will or already has slain. Important to note here is that I don't think she has to kill the people involved in lies or even physically confront them. Her merely existing slays two of these lies already. The first vision is Stannis. He has blue eyes and casts no shadow. This is for two reasons. 1. He used his shadow to kill Renly. 2. He casts no shadow because he is not true fire. As Melisandre says, shadows are children of fire and since he is not true fire, his sword is not the real lightbringer and its fire is not real. Just like it produces no heat, it casts no shadow. Dany slays this lie by being the true Azor Ahai and having an actual sword, her dragons. A clothed dragon is also obvious. It's Aegon Blackfire, a false Targaryen. Dany later refers to this as a Mammer's dragon, a kind of dragon that's used in Mammer's follies. Illyrio and Varys, Aegon's kingmakers, used to be Mammer's. The cheering crowd also does not have to be all of Westeros like some people claim. It's enough that it's the Golden Company that we see cheering for him in a dance with dragons. It's also worth noting that the clove dragon is swaying, meaning that he is unsteady. Dany slays this lie by being a true Targaryen, even according to Illyrio. The frightened child who sheltered in my man's died on the Dothraki Sea and was reborn in blood and fire. This dragon queen who wears her name is a true Targaryen. The third one is the dragon Melisandre tried to forge on Dragonstone by sacrificing Edric Storm. Dragonstone is a volcanic island, hence the tower is smoking, and the beast breathes shadow flames. It's the opposite of the first vision. In the first one, there was light but no shadows. In the second, there were shadows but no light. It points to Melisandre because she is a shadow binder. Dany slays this lie by birthing real dragons. Her silver was trotting through the grass to a darkening steam beneath a sea of stars. A corpse stood at the prow of a ship, eyes bright in his dead face, grey lips smiling sadly. A blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice and filled the air with sweetness. Mother of Dragons, Bride of Fire. The moniker Bride of Fire represents Dany's love interest. Two of those are obvious. First is the night Dany rides on silver to consummate her marriage to Drago. The blue flower on the wall is Jon Snow. His mother was associated with blue winter roses and he is currently at the icy wall. The second one is puzzling though. A corpse with grey lips points out to someone with grayscale. The only person we know has grayscale is John Connington and it's highly unlikely that he's gonna be Dany's love interest. Another possibility is that this is Egon Blackfire, infected by grayscale by John Con. But if we discard the assumption that this is about grayscale, then other people may fit. Unless they also get infected, that is. Between Drago and John, Danny has three potential love interests. Dariana Harris, Quentin Martel and his Darzo Lorak. The last of whom she even married, becoming his bride, though she does not really have romantic interests towards him. None of them are particularly associated with greyness. Quentin travels by a ship to visit the nurse and later he becomes a corpse when he tries to tame her dragons and fucks around and finds out. Grey lips could point out to him being burned to ash. There is a third possibility, one of the Greyjoys. Grey lips, grey joy, and the heavy connection with ships and sailing. This could be Euron or Victarion, who both seek out Dany's hand. That this person is a corpse can point out that they will die or are already dead, metaphorically or literally. But because the epithet is bright of fire, then it points to marriage. Dany does marry Hisdar. However, Hisdar is not particularly associated with ships nor grayness. One theory is that Hisdar might be killed by Victarion and binded to his ship the way Aeron and Falia flowers are in the Forsaken. We must wait and see. 
I'm inclined to believe that this is his dark due to the bright effect. Shadows wield and dance inside a tent, boneless and terrible. This is the vision of the past, depicting Miri's ritual. A little girl ran barefoot towards a big house with a red door. Another vision of the past, then his childhood, her running to the house with the red door. Mirima's door shrieked in the flames, a dragon bursting from her brow. This is the pyre, confirmation that Miri's blood was used for the ritual. Behind the silver orbs, the bloody corpse of a naked man, bound and dragged. Some people theorize that this is a vision of the future, that this is how Baristan will be punished for betraying Danny by running to Egon the second he hears about him. Well, I have very bad news for these people. This is another vision of the past, of the wine cellar who tried to poison Danny in Vias the Track and was punished the exact same way. A white lion ran through grass, taller than a man. There are two ways this can be interpreted. This may be the Hrakar or the Thraki Sea, a lion that Drogo killed and made a pelt out of it for Danny. Or it can be a metaphorical depiction of Tyrion Lannister. Lannisters have lions in their heraldry and Tyrion's hair is described as being so pale that it appears white, hence the white lion. The mentions of a grass taller than a man can also point out to the fact that while Tyrion is a dwarf, his spirit is metaphorically bigger than that of other men. Beneath the mother of mountains, a line of naked crones crept from a great lake and knelt shivering before her, their grey heads bowed. This is something that will happen in the future, Danny fulfilling the stallion who mounts the word prophecy. In a Game of Thrones, Danny's son is proclaimed as the stallion, but courtesy when the prophecy is made, one of the crones looks at Danny with fear, almost as if she realized that this isn't actually Rhaego, but Danny. In Danny's last chapter in A Dance with Dragons, the Traki riders find her and will probably take her to Vyas the Track so that she becomes one of the Doge Kalin. But Danny will instead unify the Traki into a single heart, just like the prophecy says. Riding a dragon, which is the mightiest mount a Tothraki can imagine, will certainly help. Ten thousand slaves lifted blood-stained hands as she raced by on her silver, riding like the wind. Mother, they cried. Mother, mother. They were reaching for her, touching her, tugging at her cloak, the hem of her skirt, her foot, her leg, her breast. They wanted her, needed her, the fire, the life, and Dani gasped and opened her arms to give herself to them. This is Dani freeing the slaves in Yunkai. Afterwards, the Undying tried to take her life forces from her, but Drogon burns them. This is when the adventure ends. As of now, we can't be 100% sure what some of these visions mean. It's possible that we might never find out. These are just my personal ideas, some of which I haven't seen expressed elsewhere. Your guess is as good as mine, so feel free to point out in the comments what you think of their meanings. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, share and subscribe so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video.